Okay, so Noah asked me to uh, give the uh, group meeting talk today, um, and so uh, what I decided to do is give you my defense talk, so I'm going to go through that whole thing all over again. Um, Just because it's such fun memories. Yeah, 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 it was so enjoyable. Um, and when I went over my defense talk, I noticed there's a bunch of slides in there that are probably unnecessary because uh, we don't have a physics education research, well, we have a physics education research group, but none of our faculty are really knowledgeable about physics education research, so there's some slides in there that are kind of like motivating slides, and why would you do this stuff anyway? Um, and there's probably a lot of detail that I'm going to skip over and spend a lot of time hopefully just having a discussion. So I'll present sort of the things that we're, we worked on, um, and then what I'm continuing to work on with my advisor and, and the next graduate student. So um, oh, here's one of the obligatory slides. What is physics education research? So I needed to give this to people who didn't know what it was. Um, but really what I want to point out to you guys are the differences in what I'm looking at. I'm, so there's content delivery methods, which um, we all know work very, very well, and they're used across a lot of um, sections of, of uh, physics courses, not just introductory level, but upper division here and other places, um, and also have been adopted across disciplines in STEM and even outside of STEM. Um, but what I'm going to focus on is changes to content of the introductory course. So my work has been focused in the introductory mechanics course, calculus-based mechanics, and we've changed the content, the topics that we're presenting, and the tools that we're presenting. Um, and so some of you may be were here when I gave my interview talk, and there's going to be a lot of similarities. Um, so uh, these are sort of the questions that I had in my thesis, and I'm not really going to read through all of them, but the idea is that we are comparing curricula, so we teach not only the sort of content reformed course, but we teach a traditional course. And by traditional, I mean the content is roughly what you would expect of any introductory course, but it is pedagogically reformed. It uses clicker questions, it uses recitation sections, tutorials, things like that, just as the, the content reform course does. So pedagogically, they're very similar, but they differ on their content. Um, uh, what I'm going to spend a lot of my time on, I think, and I hope to spend a lot of my time on, is talking about computation, using a computer to solve problems. That's what we're doing in the content reform course a lot. That was what my thesis was mainly focused on. Um, and then, unfortunately for Noah, uh, spend a little bit less time talking about epistemology and uh, a new tool that we're starting to develop and use, um, not only at Georgia Tech, but at uh, Purdue as well, um, to understand what sort of motivates students to learn computer modeling. So just to give you a sense of how we do things in the state of Georgia, or how we did things in the state of Georgia, uh, we have a very large uh, two-semester calculus-based sequence, um, 2,000 students, to give you a sense. We have about uh, 13,000 undergraduates at Georgia Tech, and so uh, 2,000 of them are taking physics every semester. Um, most of them are engineering majors, we're at engineering school, um, and in the content reform section, the matter and interactions course, <coughs> the next course, we teach about a quarter of them, so 500 students. Um, and if you're not familiar with matter and interactions, it doesn't really matter. What I want you to focus on is modern content, different content, that is um, ideas about quantum physics and relativity, the structure of matter, that those are the kinds of ideas and models that they're using. And really modern tools, this computational model. That's a very large difference between the two courses that we teach. And do, do stop meeting time. Yeah. Do you happen to know how many faculty were devoted to teaching those 2,000 students per semester? Um, about 10. 10 to 12, depending on the semester. Okay. Um, and we have uh, 35 faculty. So in any given semester, um, the matter and interaction section will have two to two to four faculty members teaching. Um, okay. Well, so so Danny, sorry. Yeah. Um, that course also has a lab associated with it. Yes, it does. Um, so, yeah. So it's so the students meet for um, for three you know one hour lectures in the big industrial lecture halls, um, and then they break out into lab sections of about twenty to twenty five students, and they work on um, computational labs and physical labs. All right, so um, this is just a slide I plug in here. But the idea is, is how do you measure um, reform? How do you measure whether it's doing any, anything to student learning? Is it, is, it, is it doing what you want? Um, and so one of the things that you can do is you can compare student performance, and you can debate about what you want to call performance, um, or what you want to call a measurement. But um, 
really what we have are two different sets of students that are going through an introductory physics course that are taught with different content, and we want to see how they compare on measures that are um, simple. So uh, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. You can use concept inventories, such as the FCI, which I'm going to talk about, um, common final exam prompts, which you've given for um, several semesters. Um, you can look at how they do in their follow-on courses. And you can also invite them in, and you can kind of peel back their answers to these concept inventories and be, unfortunately, very sad after doing so. Um, so here's just kind of the upshot of what we did. Um, we gave the FCI to lots and lots of students. This is uh, 4,300 students pre-test, 7,700 pre-test in m and I, and about uh, 2,500 or so in both on the post-test. You find that um, students in the traditional course tend to do better in that, that, and they do better by about 10% or so, and this is uh, regardless of the instructor pretty much. It's, um, and it doesn't really vary from semester to semester. Um, I have a lot of gains here, but that's just sort of unnecessary information. Um, we have a lot of detail on this in uh, an article that we have submitted and has been nominally accepted to uh, AJP. Um, it's like the archive if you're interested. Um, as far as background of students, you might think that maybe these differences come from different populations of students, right? So students enter these courses, they, they know the difference between the two, they're told the difference between the two, they can switch. Um, as far as the incoming and outgoing populations, so the students that are taking the pre-test, the students that are taking the post-test, there's no difference in their uh, GPA, SAT score, incoming, uh, uh, well, incoming FCI, obviously, um, and the grade that they entered the course. So their populations are roughly similar, and the treatment is really what's different. Yeah. So the, the content of the FCI is more similar to the content of a traditional yes, course, right? Yes, absolutely. So is it just an expected result, right? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it, it, it could be an expected result. Um, but when you talk to, say, non-educational faculty, um, the idea is that the FCI is this sort of trivial thing that all students should be doing well. And the fact that there's a difference because of these two different treatments is sort of interesting. And in fact, it's, it's interesting um, when I get, I'll get to this think about study that we did. It's actually really interesting when you start to feel back and see what they do. Um, because, yes, the traditional students do or answer questions better or more often correctly, but the way that they go about answering those questions is very different from what the matter of interaction students do. So, yeah, I, I would agree with you. Um, okay, so common final exam questions, I sort of posted this up and the details are not really important, but um, what you find is if you give students questions, um, so complex questions that they need to solve with um, pencil and paper, and you look at um, how well they do, so this is what we're going to call mostly correct responses, that is, they didn't really make a lot of mistakes. They made, maybe, maybe they forgot uh, a sign that wasn't important or they made a small other mistake, but it was pretty much right on. Um, you know, the percentages of those correct answers sort of flip-flop back and forth depending on the question, depending on the topic. And we found that matter interaction students tend to do better on the E&M questions. They tend to do better on the energy and angular momentum questions. They don't do better on um, kinematics type questions. So. Is that standard score on these exams? That's the that's the percentage of students that have mostly so correct, correct responses. Right. Okay. So no, it's not. It's not. They didn't. No, that's not the average. Yeah. Do no, we right. see some of these questions? Like, like three, so three, basically 8% of the yeah. class gets number three correct. Yeah. Mostly correct. Yeah. Uh, mostly correct. That doesn't, that means... We consider that, that success and move on. Yeah, that's... I, well, that's, well that's, we don't consider that success, but... Um, I, <laughs> dismal performance. Dismal performance. So... I it just, it's... Yeah. These look hard, like hard problems. Um, for mostly correct, yeah. I mean, you're talking, this is basically the number, the fraction of students that did the problem completely right. Right. Right, so... I mean, they're getting partial credit along the way and all that other business, so right. there's still a large number of students that did it. Right, you might read this, Noah, as, um, um, you know, on question number one, 26% of the students are A students on that question. That's probably a fair way of thinking about it. And, yeah. Yeah. So, so then all of a sudden those numbers don't look so crazy, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah, in, in, the, in our the class, profile of your typically yeah. 20 or 25% of the students are performing at what we grade as an A level. Yeah. So. I, unfortunately, I, I, oh, I, well, right. Okay. Well, I don't have copies of these questions because I helped write them, but I didn't actually write them. So, most of them have a question there. Can you give us sort of... Yeah, uh, so, what do you think? So, I think this one, 
Mechanics 2 was actually like a collision type problem where um, there's like a wall, a block came and slid and ran into the wall. And students were asked about the, you know, the velocity after the fact. Um, these, this ENM question, I want to say, was a, like a, I think it was an induction problem. There's a, a, a wire and there's a region of magnetic field that's smaller in radius than the wire and it's changing the time. They're asked about um, the current and the direction of the current. Hmm. So, um, I mean, they're challenging problems, I would say. So, um, so then, you know, the first, first thing that we tried to convince the faculty of was that we, were we weren't doing any harm. And it's clear that we're not doing that because if you look at follow-on courses, um, so this is engineering statics, this is the course mm -hmm. that Basically, every, every student that takes mechanics has to take all of our engineering majors. There's no difference in the outcome of GPA for that course. And unfortunately, if you used to take the electromagnetics course, which is actually what ENM is required for, even though they're all required to take ENM, um, there's, there's really no difference there. So maybe I'm getting a mixed message. Um, so what we decided to do was one which you might be familiar with. So I'll let you have a look at it. Okay, that's enough. And you can see that you know the, the traditional students do really well in this problem. I mean, they just they do very very well. They do much better than, than matter interaction students. But when you ask them to explain what they're doing while they're solving this problem, um, what you find is the traditional students who do well on this problem tend to sort of memorize different pieces of the problem. They've either seen it before. They remember that mass doesn't matter, but they can't explain from fundamental principles. They can't explain from Newton's second law why this is the case. Um, whereas matter interaction students treat this as a more challenging problem. They, in fact, they try to derive that this is the case. They try to prove it to themselves that this is the case, and they, they have trouble with it because it is a somewhat challenging problem to sort of re-derive this result. Uh, and, as, and as a result, they're, they're, they kind of go back to this Aristotelian view and they you know, respond incorrectly. So um, that's, that's one of the interesting things we found. We did um, several of these sort of think aloud studies with um, I think like 10 FCI questions and then a few questions that we did on our, we, we developed on our own. And we found, you know, we found the responses were what we expected. But when we looked at what students were actually doing, that was very different between the two courses. So we could, we could create a question where matter interaction students did better than traditional students. And in fact, their approaches were very different. Computation. So we're teaching computation, um, and so this is sort of another motivating slide that I use for the faculty, and it essentially goes back to something that Joe Reddish pointed out about, you know, what are the types of things we should be doing in our courses? What are the what are the types of problems that students should be presented with? What motivates them to learn these sorts of problems? And so there's this nice contrast that he gave in the paper he wrote in '93 with them. Jack, Jack Wilson, um, uh, sort of the Muppet part of the Muppet Manifesto, I think. Um, in addition, uh, and Nessessa sort of points out that maybe using computation can be a nice tool for teaching physics because of the way that it constrains language, the way that it constrains representations. Um, and so um, that might be sort of the two motivating factors for teaching computation. Um, so this is where there's going to be a lot of slides that I might just skip through because um, it's just straight from my dissertation talk. Uh, so this is how our students get computational experience at Tech. Um, this is a, a program that models the motion of a spacecraft moving around the Earth. Um, and it's sort of, it has very simple structure. It's written in Python, so the student calls a sphere to make a craft, and it generates this visualization of the sphere. Um, so we have them focus on essentially four parts. First of all, the initial conditions, how they set up the objects, how they prepare the initial conditions. Um, the second part is really the beefy part that they have trouble with, which is this force calculation how they use that force model to actually make that calculation run. Um, and then what they have sort of less trouble with are these updates. So updating the momentum, or you can think of the velocity, and updating the position. So this is kind of the experience. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about these sort of pieces. Uh, questions on this? Anyone else use Python? Yeah. Excellent. What's, what's What's Python based on? What is Python based on? Uh, yeah. That, I don't know. I think it's its own. Yeah. It's an interpretive language, and I think that's new. Um, so it's not a compiled language, like C or um, 
Right. No. It's sort of. It's a high level. It's a high level. It's high level. Yeah. I mean, it's not it's, story. Yeah. yeah. It's okay. sort of like <laughs> Java, but not quite as constrained, and it's not compiled. Right. Like Java. Uh, okay. So uh, I'll point you to this because there's a lot of details there. So we submitted a paper right before I left to PRS and it's on the archive. Um, and it basically describes all this stuff that I'm going to talk about. So um, the, tri the typical uh, way that students experienced computation before uh, we made a change was in the laboratory only. So they would go into the lab, they'd work with their teaching assistant and their group members to build a model of some physical situation. Um, it was very prescriptive, or it still is actually. It's, um, you know, they give, they're given a handout and they're sort of follow along in the handout. Um, what we found were that students tended to divvy up the workload. You always had this person, the B Python person, who was the one at the computer doing everything. And we tried a lot of different ways of doing things, including um, you know, following Ken Heller's sort of method for groups. And, and we didn't really have a lot of success with that, mainly because of uh, our students are very, they're very independent, very, um, I don't know, just very angry when you make them work together. They, they prefer to be <laughs> in their room playing World of Warcraft or something. Um, so, so they're banned. Yeah, yeah rock band. Um, so we, this limits their experience, right? They don't have, they don't get a lot of practice with it. So we, we decided to do is, well, if they want to be individually responsible, we'll make them individually responsible by providing them homework uh, exercises. So. Um, these computational modeling homeworks are what we sort of decided, what we decided to do, and uh, these are, you can think of them as sort of inspired by the way that professional computational scientists work. They write a piece of code that solves a problem, and then maybe later on they go back to that piece of code and they alter it to solve a different problem or to add something that, to the model that they didn't have before. And so that's exactly the same thing that we're doing with our students. We have them write this piece of code in the laboratory, and then they take it out of the laboratory, and they make changes to it. And those changes can range from a, you know, simply changing initial conditions to fundamentally changing the model, um, and uh, then use it to solve a problem. And these problems are graded for accuracy. They're, they use the uh, WebAssign homework system, so um, all of the nice randomization features that you get with, with computer-based homeworks uh, are available. So, uh, right, so here's that same piece of code. And here's that same piece of code changed by a student. So um, for instance, they have new initial conditions that are given to them, and they have to um, alter those. And maybe they, we ask them to create an arrow that represents the momentum vector. They have to visualize that arrow and tell us the direction of it after some amount of time. Um, so students went through quite a number of these exercises, I think 14 in all. And we wanted to evaluate whether or not they could do this on their own, because obviously we're not, um, you know, stopping students from working together. We're not, you know, stopping them from getting help from us or from the teaching assistants. So we wanted to see if we asked them to solve this problem by themselves, what kind of mistakes would they make? Where does that help us to improve um, our own, uh, uh, you know, pedagogy? How, how how we are teaching computation to them? And so what we did is we came up with this assignment, which is a, a new assignment. Um, involving a model that they had never seen before, a central force model. So it was a physical system they had had absolutely no experience with. Um, now, the students were given a skeleton code, which you can think of basically all the things in red were gone. Um, and so they were given this piece of code, um, and they had to go in and identify the things they needed to change, the initial conditions, things like that. But the main thing that they really had to update was the force calculation. They had to interpret you know, this sort of discussion of what a central force is into uh, a formula, but not only into a formula, into a formula that the Python understands. So um, this is a proctored assignment, so it was given at the end of the laboratory, um, and our TAs sort of um, walk around and, and make sure that students are staying on task, they're not sharing anything, they're not using the internet, and stuff like that. Um, so they did pretty well. Uh, roughly 60% of the students um, were able to solve this, um, which is which was surprising to us because Given our um, sort of initial implementation, we expected 33% because our groups are groups of three. We had one Python person, so we expected around 30 to 40%. Um, we got quite a bit better than that. And in fact, when you look at the errors that students are making, there were quite a number of students that were very, very close to getting it right. And unfortunately, um, WebAssign doesn't grade close, it only grades correct. So, um, okay, that's really all I want to say about that. Um, we went through and we looked at the errors, and I'm not even going to go into that. We looked at the errors 
and uh, try to categorize them in some way. We use cluster analysis to do that. If you want to know about that, we can hang out. Um, and this is the this is what we found. Um, so there were basically uh, these are so this is the percentage of students that um, had erroneous code. So this is uh, this is not 100%, but it's of the 40% that had erroneous code. Um, most of them. So these groups here essentially. Uh, had problems with the force calculation, and that was really the dominant error. They had they had problems with not only representing it as a vector, but also deciding what the unit vector should look like. Um, some of them just calculated a magnitude. Um, some of them had very interesting errors, which you wouldn't see excuse me, in, a, in an analytic problem. This very excuse me, this very last error. When you're doing uh, numerical integration, you have to do that iteratively. So you make a calculation, you update everything, then you go back and you do it again. You go back and you do it again. Um, these, you know, this 7% of students had everything perfectly right, but the whole force calculation was outside the loop. So it wasn't done iteratively. I mean, it was perfect, but it was outside the loop. So it's, some, it's basically translating this equation properly, but not knowing where it's supposed to fit in. Yeah, no. So this brings up a really interesting question about this, and I sort of goes against my own theoretical framing, but I'll ask it anyway, which is to say, you could imagine separating the representation of the physics from the understanding of the physics itself. That is, the code being the representation that's used um, in a particular instance here. How is it that they're, uh, what facility do they have in coding, and what are coding problems, and what are content or conceptual problems around that? Yes. I could probably argue against that separation, but it strikes me that the first two of those, well, when I first looked at this, the first two of those were kind of coding problems and, and later were not, although you just argued that the last one may well have been a coding problem. It might. So this is a, this is a good point. It's something that we don't actually know the answer to. So it came up in my dissertation talk because I had a college of computing ed person on my committee. And I argued that these are physics and programming errors. And it's not clear which are which, or which, which ones are you know, programming, more programming errors or more uh, like you know, conceptual physics errors. Right. Um, and he, he argued that they're, that they're sort of all programming errors. Um, because they don't understand what it is to program. But I'm not sure. I don't. I don't think that that's true. I think there's a mix, and I think what you have to do is you have to have another study where you invite students to solve this thing. You know, do a think aloud study where they're solving it and see where they're going wrong and where they're debugging, and and if they're debugging, because that's going to clarify whether it's a coding error or a, or a, a or, error. Or I, I mean, another way to say this is to say, that just to sort of tease on this. I mean, to respond to him or even myself. Um, it's it, it to say that you really can't separate the coding from the content, nor can you separate the physics content from the more traditional or canonical analytic solutions that sure. people would work out. Those two are, in fact, coupled themselves. It just happens to be in this medium, students are having more difficulty than in another medium. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's, that's true. Um, the other thing that we don't know is how, how often the students are actually debugging. So one thing I didn't mentioned was that we're looking at this code after the fact, right? They've turned this in, and we're looking at it after they've already gone through it and maybe, um, you know, they've struggled with it and they've made changes, and, and so it's not clear where they're making those changes. Um, so, right. we don't, we don't, we don't really know that. Um, okay. So uh, here's simply this. So how do we correct this? Basically. Uh, you could you could train your students to solve these problems, right? I mean, it's sort of an algorithmic approach. You could sort of train them to do that. Uh, I don't think that's the way to do it because if you start to look deeply at their errors and the types of things that they're the types of errors that they're making, they really need to be focused on debugging. And by debugging, I don't simply mean debugging code. I mean the types of conceptual um, you know reasoning that you would engage in when you're doing analytic problems. They need to do that and do this sort of programmatic. Debugging. So um, not only being able to do this qualitative analysis, but parsing any type of errors that come up when the, when, um, when the program raises an error. Um, look at that. Plenty of time, Noah. Maybe. I don't know what that is. Well, I'm happy to go back and ask you a question about yeah, the last yeah, question. Can, sure. Which is to say, how, how would you d distinguish between debugging, as you're defining it then, and sort of Schoenfeld's metacognition? Thinking about your own thinking. Yeah, it seems like a nice way, actually. To, yeah. That if you play it right, that they have to ask themselves: Is this a problem in the code? Yeah. Or is this a problem in my physics? Theory? Yeah. No, there's that, that's a that's a, so I'm not a uh, theoretical PR person, practical. Yet. Yet. Um, so what I would say is that 
the types of things that uh, that you're bringing up, I think, could be could be done by asking those types of questions to students when they're looking at code, or giving them, you know, more of this sort of uncompleted code, and, and asking them to, to sort of process whether it's a you know a programming error, or whether it's a, it's a uh, an error in the model, or something like that. Uh, so I, I, I would I would like to see more of that done in the laboratory. <coughs> Right, well, what led me to ask that question in some sense was, uh, when you said debugging, I started thinking, wow, I mean, Schoenfeld is famed for his operationalization, forget theory, the practice of, of how he teaches metacognition is to go around a class, and at any point, feel free to ask his students three questions. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? Where are you going? Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and some of that could be done with the teaching assistants. I don't think, I mean, I think, our, I would say our, our uh, Know, better or more seasoned TAs tend to do that because they know where the pitfalls are for the laboratories. But I think the laboratories themselves are sort of structured in this way that um, they're structured to make students successful. And I don't think they should be. I think they should be structured so that students fail and they have to deal with that failure and they have to figure out how that works. Um, it, it's, they're, they're too prescriptive. That's how I feel. All right, so um, so I'm not going to use a lot of big terms. I used them in my defense talk, and it got me in trouble. Um, so what's, what makes students successful? So we had these sort of different classes of students, um, ones that were able to do this, this, solve this problem correctly and others that were not. And so you might think that um, you know, this is directly, directly uh, related to how they practice, how they, how they uh, uh, work through these problems, whether they do it alone. Those types of things. That, that's probably a fair question. But another another way of thinking about it is, what sort of motivates them to learn these things? Um, how do they think about learning computation? Is it simply they just need to memorize these pieces and that's it? Or are they trying to think more deeply about it? And so the way that we want to um, sort of we wanted to probe that was by developing some sort of instrument very similar to the class or the CLAS. So now that I'm hired, can you tell me whether it's the class or the CLAS? Can you spell Dang it. C-Lats. c All right, so very similar. In fact, it was, it was, there's a lot of statements that, that we sort of drew from the c and and uh, reframed them in terms of computational modeling. Um, and, uh, so we, we started to develop this. Um, and you know I'm not going to go through all the details because you guys are very familiar with it. But the idea is that you look at how experts respond to this thing, and you look at how students align with experts. Um, you know, both before and after instruction. And uh, so this is what we're calling the compass, which is very clearly named the compass, not the sea um, <laughs> <laughs> Five point uh, survey, uh, again, it's very, very similar to the c -LAS. Um We had experts come in and help us do some validation work. Um, really, where we had, had problems, because we were pulling from the c -LAS, a lot of the questions or the statements were very, very good. They were worded very nicely. But one of the questions that our experts brought up was using the word computer modeling in the statements because would students sort of understand what that meant? Uh, in fact, if we uh, if we invited some students to come in, you know, define what's computer modeling for you, um, and almost all of them basically said it's writing a program to model something physically, which is not really what computer modeling is, but it's what we wanted them to interpret it. And, and because it was uniform, we felt comfortable in using computer modeling in all of these statements. Um, so uh, again, here's scoring, and most of you know how that's scored. You basically give students five choices, and then you don't tell them that you constrain it to three choices. Um, and so here's, here's what happens. So this is sort of a, a, a heat map, if you will, of uh, where students lie in this uh, favorable, unfavorable uh, plot. And so um, before instruction, there's a very large group of students in this very high sort of expert-like um, res response you know, region. Um, and after they go through instruction, they sort of split off. And you actually have still quite a number of students that are, that are maintaining their um, attitudes, if you will, and uh, some of them dropping quite a bit. And this overall drives you. The average down. This is actually a figure that I haven't seen in any of these sorts of uh, attitudinal surveys, but it's nice because it sort of tells you how they're separating and if they're separating, if you're getting clusters. Um, so this is with mechanic students that took this matter interactions course at Georgia Tech. Um, 
Okay, so we can look at a lot of different features. I'm going to point out this one because I think it's interesting. Um, so if you look at uh, an analysis of the variance of their, of their score, the major predictor is what college they're in. So we have six colleges at uh, Georgia Tech, uh, three of which don't matter, clearly. There's only seven students. Um, that would be, I don't know, we, we, have, we have a college of liberal arts that has one or two students per semester. I don't know what we have a whole college to do. Um, but com computing students, students in CS and computer, um, um, computer information, uh, you know, have most highly favorable scores, as you would sort of expect. Engineering students, a little bit lower than that. And then uh, students in the sciences, um, which are not physics students, because we don't have any physics students in this matter and interactions course. They take a separate honors course. So this is all biology, biochem, chemistry students. Uh, uh, classification doesn't matter. Uh, GPA doesn't seem to matter. Which is the biggest negative one? I'm sorry. I, you had that zoom in. I, just as a representational format, it's kind of screwy to have your close up much smaller. Yeah, yeah it, was, it pulled screwy. directly from my thesis. So. I know, I'm just teasing you here. But what's your big negative shift one? I can't see the this, color. This, this one here? This is uh, yeah. engineering. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is other. This is other. No, the purple one. So oh, it's, it's not, and it's not really significant if you compare So the sciences are the big negative shift. Yeah, I large. mean, you should you should look at basically well, the, uh, the black one, the red one, with, yeah. well, the other black one, the blue one. Um, the, the purple one is there for completeness, not, not to actually give you any information. Okay. All right. Um, so this is generally a freshman course, but we have sophomores taking it. Uh, we have very few juniors and seniors that take it, and uh, those differences don't matter because there's a very small number of students. Uh, it turns out that their, their GPA, their incoming GPA, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually not surprising because uh, Georgia Tech um, recruits students that do very well uh, on the AP exam. So their scores are already inflated. So our belt, if you look at the uh, sort of bell curve for GPA for freshman students, it's like that. Mm -hmm. Basically, everybody has a 3.85. Right. So what's the, what's the larger negative one there? This one Which here. Is that? These are students with a GPA between um, half and, and um, one standard deviation below the mean. Okay. Um, Those aren't very big negative shifts. I mean, they're a little bit. Um, course grade doesn't matter in this section, but um, post-instruction post public scores actually depend on course grade in our e &M section and at North Carolina State. Um, so this might be just an artifact of this. We've only given this one semester, so after collecting more data, it might be about to figure that out. And you can see that sort of here, all of these sort of drop down, all these arrows drop down, um, except for the black one. The black one are students who've scored um, one standard deviation above the mean of the course, and they maintain their um, attributes. Uh, all right, so we constructed dimensions. We did it in the exact same way that Wendy Adams did, so I'm not going to go through all that. Um, but I'll give you the upshot. The upshot is um, we found eight dimensions. Um, labeled them here, basically how students think about their own ability to use computation, how useful they think computation is, whether they think computation is connected to how real world science is done, um, whether they try to make sense of the computer model or the physical model to make sense of the computer model, um, whether they apply expert-like behaviors, which, which would basically be sort of debugging ideas, um, whether they avoid doing novice-like things, just sort of plugging in and memorizing. Uh, their own personal interest for learning computation and whether they avoid <coughs> memorizing syntax. Okay, so those are the, f yeah. <coughs> Go ahead, no. There's a whole group here, so, but um, did you break this out by thing group? I mean, that first one seems like a very different kind of thing in, in terms of it's more of a self-efficacy issue. Yeah, absolutely. So the very next slide, so this is some statements that we will talk about later. Um, so these are these are the same shift diagrams, but for each category. And if you look at the ones that shift up, or essentially are maintained, those I, I think this is quite interesting because it has to do may, I think with our students. Because if you look at North Carolina State students, you get something very different. Um, so students, our students seem to think that they're just as good as they were at computer modeling before learning it. Um, they report that they do, um, you know as many expert-like things as they did before, and that they avoid uh, memorization. But one of the things that's quite interesting is that this big sort of purple line here is whether or not they tried to make sense of the computer model. 
Um, and so even though they sort of think that they're just as strong with modeling, they also think that they don't have to think very deeply about doing the modeling. And that might actually speak to the types of things that we're asking them to do in the course. Um, like I said, they're very prescriptive. And so they, they don't have to do a lot of sense making. Yeah, no. Can, can you explain? <clears throat> I'm just trying to interpret that picture. Can you oh. explain to me what an arrow going I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. This is a pre-test, this is post-test. Right, I'm just thinking like... Right. Talk, so the 45 degree line is everybody totally agreeing, uh, either yeah. um, answering favorably or unfavorably. So what I was going to say is, is those lines slightly up to the right, that's still negative. I agree. Yeah. Um, uh, which is, people are less ambivalent, which is what means that if you're off the 45 degree line. These, you're right? still these here? Yeah. They're less that's not, that's not no shift. No, a little bit more favorable, no, a little bit more you, unfavorable. Yeah, but you so you, you can talk about there not being a I guess no shift, but there's no statistical shift. Right? You have well, to compare you have to compare if, them before, if before and after the percent statistical. unfavorable. What's that? If you look at the percent unfavorable, that's going up, which means more people are going from neutral to unfavorable. Right, but whether that measurement is within the error. Sure. Is what matters. And that's that's what I'm reporting. Okay. Here. This is no shift within error. Okay. Got and it. so more data would tell you whether that's actually a real shift. So I, I don't disagree with you. I'm just saying, you know, so you somewhat, to be somewhat to precise about it. Yeah. I, I, so. So all you're of basically these, saying that those are just yeah. He, not this is, so it's not that they're going up and right. It's that they're small. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, just, and the other ones that are all going down are actually statistically significant. Those differences are. Those axes have different units as well, so the up yeah. is worth twice as much. Yeah, you know, one unit up is twice as much as one unit right. So that's actually, right. it does help balance it a little bit. Yeah. Dude, what kind of representation yeah. do you use? <laughs> I just got that. <laughs> that's okay. I, I, get, I get it. You've got to hide all the details and just get out before you have to battle the snake. <laughs> so, um, so here's sort of a table of, of what you know I, I showed you a minute ago, and I'm pointing out just two things. I'm really pointing out sort of, oh, actually, no, this is, I'm sorry, I pulled that slide out. Uh, this is this is uh, what we what we were decided to use it for. Um, we compared students who passed our computational assessment, that, that thing I showed you guys earlier, and those who failed. And you find that um, within error, uh, there is actually a difference in the pre-test and the post-test scores for these two classes of students um, overall. Now, in all the other dimensions, it's it's uh, essentially the same story. But what's interesting is that um, students who passed had very high reporting of this sort of sense-making idea, but it, it dropped very significantly. And this this drop is much more is much larger than this drop, which is somewhat interesting. Um, the other thing is that uh, this personal interest category, this drop is more significant than this drop. All the other drops are actually within error. Um, so so the students who fail are reporting far less personal interest. But the sense making is reversed, but yeah. maybe. The sense making is reversed? Yeah, yeah passed, was surprised lost. by the fact that the people who passed had such a big drop in sense making. Yeah. Although maybe they're just becoming better students. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, they might, what you're pointing out is that the activities that they were engaged yeah. in didn't require sense no, making. No, they're passing and, and they're self aware. I mean, no, it's. Oh. Yeah, I, I think that might be true. I think it's. I think it's that they've sort of figured out what the game is, and they're just playing it properly. Um, so we have to change the game. So, uh, all right. So we we did this with other populations. We're not going to talk a lot about this, but they. Well, I'll talk about it on the slide. Uh, with the ENM students, ENM students are not at Georgia Tech are not doing the computational homework, um, and their compass scores are statistically similar similar overall and across all dimensions, which maybe speaks to our intervention and how bad it is. Um, NCSU mechanics students, I would say, are less academically prepared and I'm careful to say that, but essentially their SAT scores are about 20% lower than those of Georgia Tech students, and um, they have less favorable scores. So it gives us sort of a, a measure of preparedness, if you will. Um, and they're not doing the computational homework as well. Um, now what is quite interesting is we have, a, we have an honors uh, section that's taught within um, our mechanics section, and these honor students have, okay, this is really disgusting, basically they have very different um, uh, shifts in these, in these categories. Um, and they are, let me give you a background here, the 
The honor students are taught in the exact same section as our non-honor students. There's no, there's no difference. They sign up for an honor section and they're put into a, a regular section. Like um, they're taught with 200 students, and there's, so there's 21 that are taught with 200 other students. Um, and in fact, these honor students don't do any better in the course. They don't have a better GPA. They don't have better SAT scores. They didn't do better on the computational assessment, but they report a very different um, result. Um, what are they, how, how are they identified? Yeah, how do they become honors? They are invited by somebody. I'm not sure. On the basis of? I'm not sure. I asked that and no one could tell me a straight answer. So basically there's a group of students who are labeled honors. Mm -hmm. who, that's it. Not they, physics majors. We have a physics majors honors course. So these are, these are like engineering, sciences, honors students in the honors program. But at least within this class, they don't do anything differently, right. and they don't perform But outside any of the class, they meet together a lot. They have interaction uh, with, with faculty a lot. So they, oh. so they have this sort of outside yeah, experience yeah. that's very different from your typical student. And it's possible, one of the things that came up in my dissertation talk was whether these students are tracked for research early on. So this is, this is data from the spring. Um, so if they came in in the fall, they might have already been tracked for research oh. positions. So they might be doing undergraduate research already. That could be another sort of confounding factor. Uh, all right, so I think uh, so the compass can be used, I think, as a research tool, but it also, more importantly, I think, to enhance instruction, sort of give you feedback on what types of things you're doing in your course. And I think both of these things, the, the results from the compass and our, our computational error analysis have told us that well, the way that we have our lab structured and the things that we're asking students to do are not working properly and we need to do something different. Um, and so I think that has to do with um, sort of developing their problem solving skills, giving them tasks where they have to fail to do it right. Um, so I, I will sort of close with this. Um, let's see how much more is on here. There's one thing I really wanted to get to, which is kind of interesting. Um, so I'm still working with my group um, to the extent that I can. And we're actually developing um, a computational modeling curriculum that will be embedded in the modeling curriculum from Arizona State. Um, so computation will be sort of a new representation um, for that. And we're doing that with the Westminster schools at Georgia Tech, or, uh, in Georgia, and um, a school in New York State, a uh, public school in New York State that uses the modeling curriculum. Um, so throw some interest there. And if you want to know how you've made it and how you know you're done, so Katie, for you, if you make it on Reddit, I think you're done. So have you, has anybody actually looked on Reddit? Oh, man. I just ruined your entire week. Yeah. So Reddit is this sort of news aggregating website where people can vote up or down on um, stories. Um, and it's an incredible time suck, um, which is why it took me six years to graduate. Um, and so this is But boy, actually, you know a lot. But boy. Boy, do I know where to find things on Reddit. Um, so Reddit, uh, Reddit slash r slash programming is essentially a, a, a feed for all of these sort of programming stories. And a blog post about my thesis um, made it to Reddit. And there's a very nice, actually, a very interesting set of comments. So I'll just sort of, you might not be able to read this. Uh, the best comment is, can you read it? Yeah, like, I'll read it to you guys. Am I to understand that this is trying to teach people physics and computational modeling all in one go? I seem to remember students had a hard time with physics, um, were also lost in CS classes as well. So I wouldn't expect this to be helpful to the average physics student. Am I missing something here? And then there's a whole chain of people responding to this guy. Um, this is actually, I think this is the graduate student that took over for me. Responding and explaining things, and it, it actually drove a very nice um, discussion about well, while we were at uh, APT. Actually, that's when I found out about this. So, um, so get your research on Reddit as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> like the handle, newbie, newbie programmer. programmer man. Man. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, so there's a bunch of people to thank, and that's it. So we can chat or whatever you guys want to do. Thanks for your time. Uh, so I was a TA for Matter Interactions last semester, and one of the things I was wondering is you gave them this, uh, like, a, like a, the test where you delete big parts of the program, yeah. and then they put it in, and they pass. That's interesting that they did so well, I, I think, too. Yeah. Did you give them, like, a, a regular test about the content that was supposed to be, like, delivered through your the models? And did they answer, like, actual 
non-modeling like interpretive stuff, questions. interpretive yeah. questions yeah. about that. About um, those topics. So the computational modeling homeworks that I, I showed you guys um, not only have you know can you plug in the right stuff and get you know get this get the numerical integration to work out, but it also has interpretive questions. So you know things about the directions of uh, the force and the and velocity vector and what the object's going to do in the future and, and stuff like that. So. It, there's, it's in that, but it's not <coughs> part of the assessment. It's not like a separate, like, no computer in front of you test. Oh, no, we, we yeah. do that, yeah. We, so they're, they're, typically what we had done was actually give them pencil and paper tests where they basically filled out the code um, and then did some interpretation oh. um, on the like, final exam and usually on the third or fourth test. Um, and in fact, those problems used to be the ones that drove the average down, and after this exposure, they're not anymore. So. Um, so are you working with Harry on this? Uh, sort of, yeah. They're trying to Im implement matter interactions yeah. across all the engineering curriculum intro at great. Texas. So uh, it's pretty interesting. Cool. Yeah, no. I have two questions. Um, I'll ask my first one. Um, and apparently a statement. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, and I apologize if you already answered this. No problem. I missed it. Um, do you have any measures that correlate how students respond on the compass, what they actually do? Do I have it's, measures that correlate it, it with, the, like, with the compass? It seems like the compass is asking about students' attitudes and their beliefs about um, right. what it means to do right. computer science, what kind right. of problem solving strategies yeah. they use. And what I'm wondering is, what they're basically doing is checking boxes. Which is supposed to correlate yeah. with what they believe. Right. The question is, is that what? Is right. That so, really so what we we haven't we we haven't compared um, how students perform on computational modeling, say exercises or, or assessments, mm -hmm. with those compass scores. What we did was we separated students who passed and students who didn't pass the computational assessment, and we found that there was you know more expert-like attitudes in those who passed on average than those who did not. Um, right. Now, to, to do what you're saying, I think, is very valuable. Um, but it, but you would have to have something where you could do a correlation, where you could have partial credit awarded. And unfortunately, in the way that we have our assessment structured, because it's delivered through the homework system, there's no way of giving partial credit. Although the rubric that I developed for scoring the whole thing could be, that could be used for partial credit. And then yeah. now you could correlate. You yeah. could also use uh, qualitative methods where you use video or, or uh, watch students while they're actually mm -hmm. programming and code for what they do and sure. see whether those things that they do are associated with what they say. Absolutely. Because, you know, yeah, that's, that's there, true. there are two sides to this. One is what you believe about yourself and the other is what you actually do. And those right. are associated, but they're not always the same. Right. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Um, um, and then my other uh, question uh, is um, one of the things I wonder about attitude surveys in general, yeah. uh, especially when I look at the, and I, I work on this some too, so um, way early on, uh, is that when I read the questions and talk to other physicists about the questions on the CLAS, the more I think about them, the more confused I am. <laughs> and the less sure I am that I, that I know all the, all the favorable answers. Yeah. And so one of the things I wonder is whether this going from like one of yours, one of your questions up there was uh, computational modeling is related to the real world, yeah. or something like that. When I read that, I, I think I don't know. Some are, you know, some computational models aren't, some some aren't. Yeah. And so it seems like if I answered that question definitely at the beginning, the more I thought about it, I might actually get less sure and answer different. So it looks like going down in expert life might actually be people getting more sophisticated when thinking about these questions that don't have absolutely yeah. yes or no answers. Well, I think the way that you could sort of investigate, you could investigate that in the classroom, at least, is doing the sort of things that, uh, that Ellie Sayer does, where she gives these types of assessments to groups of students periodically. Mm -hmm. And you could, you could see, you know, sort of, if there's this temporal change. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a pretty interesting question to ask. And, and I agree with you that Sometimes hard. There was one. I think there was one statement that we were when we wrote it. We were like completely sure that it was going to go this way, and and 
liked it. And we gave it to our you know our experts, and almost without a doubt, they picked something else. I cannot remember what it was. It was like uh, I, I don't. Know. That's actually interesting. It's a little yeah. surprising. So like I'm I'm in no way saying that these results aren't like valuable. Yeah, no. Or meaning, but, no, I, it, you know it would it would be interesting to see if like suppose one of the problems you solve is a is a physics problem about falling bodies or yeah. something like that. Maybe after that, students are saying yes. It, Modeling has to do with the real world, and then yeah. you do one where it's you know, it's, it's a hypothetical central force yeah. problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Or something totally right. abstract, yeah. and then they're like, oh, okay, forget it. I, I don't believe that anymore. It's right. you, yeah. you model tranches of CDOs, right? How connected to the real world is that? The answer is not. Um, uh, totally disconnected from my real world. So. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, this just came up. Well, the rating agencies and how they rated the oh, yeah. uh, uh, subprime mortgages. And that, in some sense, how they justify producing AAA ratings for uh, 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 slices of uh, bundles that had been completely rated as junk. And yeah. you reorganize them, and they come out of AAA, and they're like, yeah, yeah, but that's what the model said. Yeah. Which, they, you know, yeah. sort of another. Pretty that's good if you just lost your retirement. So I, I will say this, though, that um, all of the exercises that students do in the laboratory and on their um, homework, with the exception of this assessment, relate to a real world physical situation. Sure. So, I mean, I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying that, just, yeah, that, yeah. just to give you sort of a background. Um, and the reason we decided to use the central force problem was because it was somewhat similar to the gravitational. I mean, it, it's identical to the gravitational problem for our lines too, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we chose exponents that were not our to, to give them something different that they still had a little bit of experience with, but it was different enough. So it might be. Okay. Yeah. And, and I also think just to play on that, I mean, I think just because the really sophisticated answer is it depends, with all things maybe in education, like, oh, you know, it depends on the problem here. You can say, well, an overall objective that we do have in this class is for students to be able to tie these particular computational tools to real world situations, and, and you drive the education that way. And so yes. you can, right, miss out on people being extraordinarily sophisticated, but Hopefully they go through this maximum beforehand of agreeing with yeah. what we consider favorable. Question for you um, related to this. It strikes me that some work within physics and ways that we go about working in physics are particularly susceptible and um, benefit from an idea of computational modeling. Stepwise um, incremental movement, thinking about motion, thinking about integration Absolutely. in a particular way. But it also strikes me that there are some areas within physics that may not be particularly susceptible to this, and you have to kind of force shoehorn that in to this particular representational format. Do you see that? And I mean, is that, I mean, maybe this was the answer that you showed at the beginning, which is to say M and I students do well on particular kinds of problems and not others. Yeah, yeah so, um, so the types of problems that they did well on were these sort of more discrete problems. Because if you think about it, that's what numerical integration is discrete steps. Right. And so they get they get this experience with thinking very carefully about if they're given two snapshots, they know they're two snapshots. They know they're you know the one yeah. is after the other and they know how to relate those two. Um, when you have something that's more continuous, um, they have they tend to have a little bit more trouble with it. Or maybe emergent, like many body problems. I mean sure, I, I mean sure. it could be, but yeah. yeah. Um, now uh, I guess to so We've worked very carefully in mechanics, and we've only worked in force and motion. And the reason for that is exactly like you said, it fits very nicely with force and motion, prediction of motion, uh, numerical integration, all those types of things. Um, we haven't figured out a way to do this in E&M um, because the types of problems you solve numerically in E&M are very sophisticated and um, might not be tractable. Um, I mean, we haven't really thought very carefully about it because we focus so much on, on mechanics. We also haven't brought in things like energy and angular momentum because um, we really want to get across to students that prediction of motion is what you can use computation for in this course. Um, and that was a, that was a choice we made very early on. Um, and now I will say we are doing the same thing, like I said, with ninth graders. Um, and we've been doing this with middle school teachers in the summer, and they have no problem with it. I mean, using using this computational tool, we actually wrote um, a layer on top of Python to make it. Track, you know, to make computation trackable at an even lower level. So they're not writing all of these you know, complex statements. They're sort of focusing on the integration. Um, and with middle school teachers who've had you know, 
have no experience with using a computer to do that. They did fabulous this summer. I mean, they, they, they have the sense of how to do things locally, um, even though they don't know the equation of a line. You know, they can they can figure out how to reproduce the equation of a line and connect that back to what's supposed to be going on, but they, they couldn't do it analytically. It took this sort of local stepwise way of doing things to get them uh, up to par. So, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, oh, what, what changes... <laughs> Uh, what changes do you want to see happen to the way you implement the computational physics, uh, homeworks, or math? Yeah, um, I would. Well, one of the big things I'd like to see is actually uh, student code being being um, turned in and graded rather than only judging them based on you know the final result. I think that that's really important. And we you have say that, that now that you're not a grad student anymore. Well, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't have had to grade it anyway because I had a small army of graduate students that were doing things for me. So. Uh, I would I would like to train like a very young you know batch of graduate students to use these rubrics. I mean the rubric we developed was very general, so just to be able to score their own lab section and to give students feedback on how they're writing computer models. Now the other part of that would be training um, how we're developing students' usage of computer modeling and their debugging efforts and basically revamping the labs you know completely based on this. I mean it's, there, there's too much hand-holding, and there's too much um, you know, prescribed effort. Um, and they're not, you know, they're not having to, to bring any real problem-solving skills to bear to solve these things. So they ever have to present to the rest of their class that, so, or justify the reasons for doing yeah, a course so we, way? We, Not in the regular semester, but in the summer semester, I, I taught the course, uh, I, so I, I teach the course, I taught the course in the summer, um, and we did a project at the end of the summer as the final, not, not the final exam, but as the last test um, because it's a smaller class. And so one of the things we told them they had to do was you have to include a deep Python model of whatever situation we're, we're talking about or whatever situation you want to present. Um, and it was only then that students were coming into the office and getting help and trying to really figure it out. And you know, by the end of the class, you know, the course reviews were like, I really understand now why we're doing computational modeling. Like it was, you know, and, so having them struggle to do something that they're interested in. I mean, it seems like you had them just turn in with their homework a short paragraph about why you wrote the code yeah. this way. Yeah, but but you have to have somebody to look at that. Well, I mean, even if you just wanted to code it for your yeah. own understanding. Yeah. both. So 
And I guess it's part of the experimental question of yeah. whether whether it works. Well, also what it is that you're what it is that you're really doing. Like, what are the goals in terms of sort of learning in physics? And which goes back. Right, to but I certainly have this you know initial uh, fear reaction of like adding computation to just the, the logistically adding you know, the grading and the training and the and the teaching and all the problems right. that arise the first time anybody starts trying to code. Um, so it's like pretty, pretty big learning curve. So I had this reaction initially when I was like going to be a TA for this, thinking like this is ridiculous, like this is going to fail. With, there's like a, we have like a pre, like a first lab that's just like a how do you code lab. They get it in like a week and a half. There's yeah. no, it, it, in fact, it's so prescriptive that that becomes like irrelevant, the coding issues, but by halfway through the semester. Like they, they no longer forget to, put, also Python is like incredibly easy yeah, in terms of there's no level. syntax really. Yeah. So actually, this was a huge, a huge hurdle. Became like almost like irrelevant, like no, not we, really we important. Same, we um, had the same issues yeah. at Tech when we decided to adopt it, and but we did the stage in very slowly, which I don't think Harry's doing. I think he's sort of. Trying we had like one, we, one yeah. week, and then it's ba yeah. bam right into it, and yeah. I didn't think that was issue. I thought more of the issue is they didn't understand what the benefit of the coding was yeah. for because of the way it was like formatted. Yeah. But the actual coding was not like a big problem. Yeah. Um, my experience. Yeah, yeah we've, we've, I mean, we've, we've been using it for, I think, five years now. And we started off with a very small section taught by a postdoc that was hired to do it. Um, and then sort of just trained faculty, you know, mentored them. So you had one faculty member co-teaching a course at a semester, and then they would go and teach someone else. And so now there's a total of, I think, nine faculty members that teach matter interactions or can teach matter interactions. And, and the students, for for whatever reason, tend to fill up that course first. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, they're requesting overloads for matter interactions, um, even though there's a traditional course that fits their schedule. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying to bring it here, I'm just asking about computation in general. Okay. Uh, well, um, I took all the like, lab courses. You're going to speak up. Sorry, I took all of the lab courses and the um, courses here for undergrad, and um, I noticed in the lab courses, like the freshman sophomore labs, you use this horrible programming language called MathCAD, where you could easily use Python or MATLAB. And that's, I think it would actually be easier than MathCAD because it's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, Python has a very nice set of tools that allow you to collect data and things like that from, um, and, and, and then pro and you can process it. Um, it just has to be sort of structured at the right level for the students. Like when you when you adopted in Texas or Georgia Tech, it's not like you added it on top of an existing lab class. Like it totally just washed. You just eliminated the previous lab course, brought in a new matter interaction lab with Python. The, like so I, at Texas and at um, Georgia Tech, students who take engineering physics are required to take a lab course no matter what, and the lab courses are tied. Because uh, I, I went there as an undergrad, if I remember correctly, they're tied directly to the course. So you sign up for like. 303L and you you also get yeah. 101 or 103L. Or something. Well, at Texas it was a, we did it a little differently than you because we only, we didn't have 14 we had like six or seven and so we had a recitation section once a week and then every other week we would do this we would do the simulation the modeling in the recitation in the recitation okay. so actually the lab class class which is so far not tied at all at all is they just did a regular whatever they're doing the lab yeah, um, yeah so, but it's a plants. It's not on top of something else. It's yeah. an extra hour or something. Yeah, students that sign up at Georgia Tech for a physics course, yeah, intro physics course, are also signing up for the lab at the same time. So it's like like they sign up for the course plus the plus the lab. So if they're in a matter of interactions lab, because they're in the course. Yeah. So my answer to your question is yes. We we need to teach computation, computational thinking, and and there are uh, and the question then is where and how. And one really interesting question is, does it belong within content disciplines or as a separate kind of thing? Is it its own discipline and, and way of thinking um, uh, about that? And I suppose the answer is, yeah, both. Um, there is a big movement, I, and, and if you continue working on this or want to, I definitely introduce you to Clayton Lewis, Mike Eisenberg, and Alex Repening. So what it strikes me is, is that you could imagine be Python, or sorry, uh, Python having a, a visual layer on it, not just um, the B-Python stuff, but to move to this idea of agent-based modeling, 
um, which is very accessible to kids as young as five, um, uh, where you end up uh, programming the attributes of actors within the systems, and that they have sort of long-standing. Um, uh, maybe you already have this. Uh, no, so we haven't done that, but I was going to point out something that I think you have, I think it's very... Uh, anyway, so... Yeah. Um, so so what, we, what we've done with these ninth grade students is actually develop, like, like I said, a layer on top of Python that basically right. allows you to instantiate these classes. And so, it, let's go down to the bottom where it's actually very interesting. So, in the modeling curriculum in physics, motion maps are kind of a big thing for them when they're talking about right. motion. And so we developed a couple of things you know, that we call motion map. Essentially, it's a class that students call um, to generate a motion map of the system that they're integrating. And so it gets at these sort of qualitative ideas and it brings it down to a level because doing this is really challenging. If you try to do it, you know, even with calculus-based physics students, telling them right. you need to divide this, you need to see if it's the right time step, and then you need to create the arrow and you know put in the if statement. No, right. We don't do any of that. We just we have this thing you call it, you tell it how many you want to do. Um, and so we're this is what we're currently testing with um, uh, these ninth grade students. And it's actually uh, I, I had a meeting with a fellow who is a high school teacher in California who was hired by Google through their exploring computational thinking program. Um, and he's going to be using this and we're going to be working together to develop a curriculum that will be on Google sites, but for um, you know this level, ninth grade, tenth grade level. Well, we should talk about it. I and mean, one thing that strikes me is, is um, if I have this right, philosophically different though, one is to say, all right, here what I'm doing is I'm talking about the motion and already trying to figure out the time steps that's involved, whereas opposed to an agent-based approach, is to say here, here is this standard action for an agent, which is to say every time um, it, it just keeps moving forward in this direction, yeah. either plus one or right. it times two or whatever it happens to be if you're sort of accelerating. And then you either populate the screen with it or run it through time yeah. um, along the way. Yeah. Strikes me as a complementary approach. No, yeah, I agree, I, and I, I've heard of those approaches for much lower levels, like fourth, fifth grade yeah. type level. Um, I think what we're doing is, since we're doing this with ninth grade, it's already part of a physics and physical science class. Right. So we're trying to, you know, use what we've already learned about computational modeling higher, higher education realm and, and bring it down, but we're not. We're not yet looking at going. Right, might be interesting for you. I mean, ultimately, I don't want to push you, but might be interesting for you to. Uh, I could imagine trying to bridge these two from these yeah. two different directions. And if some, if a kid were well prepared through agent-based modeling, yeah. then they could actually come to this idea and say, "Oh, you know what? I'm going to um, use this uh, uh, um, class uh, that I draw from D Python in order to do a motion map, yeah. um, which then is a yet more sophisticated representation than yeah. an agent-based." No, I like that. Yeah. Okay, we'll get on there. Yeah. <laughs> it's done. Yeah, done. <laughs> it did it last week. There you go. Thanks. Um, well, thanks again, Danny. Thank you, guys.